good morning, Worship Center family. Are you glad to be in the in church today? Oh, yeah. yeah. I'd rather be in the church than in the best hospital in town, right? I mean, you know, that's <laughs> not a good option, but hey, that works. I'm so glad that you're here. My name's Justin, for, the, for those that are maybe new this morning, and I'm the lead pastor of the church. And I'm so glad that you're here. This is a special day. We've got a lot of neat things planned. We've got a special speaker, and we never all, uh, almost have a special speaker. And so that's so awesome where I get to take notes, right? And it's, it's, so, it's going to be great. Uh, another thing, if you are new to the worship center, uh, and this is your first time here, I know that going to a church for the first time could be a big step. I mean, it could be like, ah, uh, and so we want as a church to really make it an easy process and to help you with that, but we would love to connect with you, and so if this is your first time here, uh, Mike, our worship pastor here, uh, um, he'll be signing autographs, no, no, I'm just joking, he's not signing autographs, but he will be at this banner that says first-time guest, and we would love, we have a small gift for you, just to say thanks for coming, and we hope that, we, we're glad it's your first time here, but we hope it's not your last time here, and so excited about that. Uh, something pretty amazing is happening Wednesday. Wednesday, we have our, you know, pretty unique worship night, and that's happening this Wednesday. We only have about two of these a year, so you're not going to want to miss this. A great time of extended worship. It starts at 7 on Wednesday, and it's going to be fantastic. You're not going to want to miss that. Uh, so if worship is your thing and you're like, I just wish Mike would go longer, this is your night to have that. So it's, it's just a pretty cool thing. Yeah, yeah. So one person is going to be there. Uh, that's great. That's all right. I'll be there too, Mike. So it's all good. All right. Um, so I just, I, I, Mike came to me a couple of weeks ago and he said this, he, he said, Justin, we hit a milestone. I'm like, what? You know, he said, Justin, we hit 50,000 downloads for our video podcast. I thought 50,000. I guess that's pretty good. I don't know what Joe Rogan does, but I think that's pretty, uh, Joe Rogan does that probably in an hour, but, uh, I, I thought it was probably really neat, but it made me think about that any technology like the church uses is only because of your generosity. And just to let you know that, you know, I don't know how many video podcasts, but on average, a hundred people are watching online right now. And they may be sick at home and couldn't make it to church, or they could be stationed. We get people stationed all over the world, and they don't have an opportunity to go to church, but they can still be a part of the worship center family via online. Isn't that awesome? But it's because of your financial partnership that makes things like that possible. And so I just wanted to say thank you so much. And so if you're interested in giving this morning, there's a couple of different ways you can give, and you can see that on the screens. But uh, if you're wanting to give physically this morning, we have uh, these giving stations in every entryway. And so uh, you could just drop off your offering there, and that would be fantastic. Now, Mike is about to get into worship, and we're going to sing some songs. But before we do, I think it's important for you to meet your neighbor. So if we could all stand up to you at this point, I think it's important. I want you to turn and meet your neighbor and also ask them, is it okay if you sing really loud? Over 
Just one word 
was like you spoke it to be you were already worthy there was a song that carries on we sing with heaven to you all all glory people whose lives have been changed because of what you have done for us. And God, we just ask that today that we would just, God, our hearts would just be changed, God, by your word. And God, just by your spirit and your presence, God, working on our hearts, Father. And Lord, we give you all praise and all the glory and all the honor and all the splendor, just like we sang this morning. We love you. We praise you and everybody today said a big amen. You guys could be seated this morning.
So we're going to be talking about this very pressing issue that we see worldwide, and we've got a guest here this morning, Josh, he's going to be speaking to us. Uh, he's a Midwest Regional Consultant for World Vision, and uh, the thing about Josh is we go uh, a, you know, a few years back, and one of my best uh, moments, I, I remember being a lead pastor for, I think it was like eight months, and we found ourselves at Hartsfield uh, Airport in Atlanta, Georgia, waiting for a flight. Have you ever been there, right? Just waiting for a flight. And some of the encouragement, Josh, you gave me that day, I still have today, and I just want to appreciate uh, all that. And even your recent calls, and even when we hike the rim trail together, um, I appreciate your love and concern and encouragement. And unfortunately, Josh can't be that encouragement to everyone because I found him first, so he can't. So if you uh, want to call him, I'm not giving his number out. So, he, uh, But he's a, a great inspiration, and so I can't wait to have him share with us about this issue. And so will you give a big first, uh, worship center welcome to Josh this morning? <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Love you, man. Well, it is such a joy uh, to join you and to be in Almogordo this weekend. Um, as Justin mentioned, I served as a senior pastor for 18 years in a couple of different churches in New Hampshire for 10 years and then west of Chicago for 10 years. And that's when our paths crossed. I was a part of a network of senior pastors that got together on a regular basis. And Justin and I had the joy of being in that same cohort. And, uh, and these days, though, I'm serving with World Vision. And for some of you, you may be unfamiliar with who World Vision is. Others of you, maybe you've interacted with our ministry for years. You may be interested to know that uh, World Vision is serving in more than 100 different countries, trying to address the root causes of poverty where people are living on less than $1.90 a day. And we've had the joy of doing that for nearly 70 years now. And over that course of time, we've had an opportunity to be involved in lots of different transformational community development work, which has allowed us to become the largest non-governmental provider of clean water in the world and the largest provider of food aid. And we do it boldly in the name of our Lord. But mostly these days, we're inspired by you, by this remarkable faith community. Again, as I, as I mentioned, I've had the joy of sort of being a part of your church from a distance through Justin over the years. And I'm just grateful for this vision that you have to be for Otero, to be a place that wants to embody the love of Jesus in such a way that you reach beyond these walls out into your community and invite others to get to be a part of that same transforming work. And I'm so grateful for Justin's leadership and for Audrey's leadership and the way that they have loved and cared for this church. You have an amazing pastor. You do. Who comes from a great legacy of pastors. I mean, this is a church which is so deeply rooted in this community and making such a difference. And as Justin mentioned, we did have the joy yesterday. We spent about the first part of the morning, pretty much the whole morning, uh, hiking the rim trail together. That was such a beautiful lookout. And we looked out over your city and we sort of prayed in our spirit as we were hiking there in between our, our huffs and puffs at 9,000 feet or whatever we were, right? And, uh, and really considered all that God still is yet to do in this community. And when we were up there sort of walking that rim trail, it made me think of a story. Can I share a story here with you this morning yes. about a town that was high up in the mountains that straddled the banks of a beautiful stream. And that stream was the source of life for its village. And it was fed by springs that were as old as the earth and as deep as the sea. And the water that flowed through those springs was clear like crystal. And high up in the hills, far beyond anyone's sight, lived an old man who served that town as keeper of the springs. And he would travel around from one spring to the other, clearing it from branches and debris that might otherwise pollute the water. And his work went largely unseen. But one year, the town council got together and decided they had better things to do with their money. Have you ever known town councils to do that? And so instead of paying this old man up in the hills, they decided they had roads to repair and taxes to collect and bridges to build. And so the unseen 
stream cleaner became a luxury they could no longer afford. And the old man left his post. And high up in the mountains, the springs went untended. And branches and twigs muddied the creek bed. And after a while, it turned parts of that stream downstream near the village into stagnant bogs. And for a while, no one noticed. But then, suddenly, things were not the same. The water began to look brackish. Some people in the town began to grow ill. And now everyone, everyone noticed the loss of sparkling beauty that used to flow between the banks of the stream that fed the town. See, the life of the village depends on the health of the stream. And the stream depends on its keeper. So the town council reconvened, changed their minds. Ever known town councils to do that? And money was found. And the old man was rehired, and after yet another time, the springs were clean again, and the water was pure again, and children played again on its banks, and illness was replaced by health. And in the village, there was fullness of life. Because, of course, the life of the village depends on the health of the stream, and the health of the stream depends on its keeper. And church, I just want to make a suggestion this morning. That the stream is our world, and you are its keeper. We are living in a beautiful, fascinating world, aren't we? A world that is filled with the aroma of coffee houses, the laughter of good friends, a world that gives you a full moon over the white sands. I went out there late last night. It was a beautiful sight to see. A world that is filled with cuisine of a favorite restaurant. I mean, take, for example... The Tiger Burger from Heidi Ho. <laughs> Y'all, I came into town. I went straight to Heidi Ho. I sat down with a Tiger Burger and a cherry lime. I mean, is there anything better than a Tiger Burger? No better proof to the existence of God <laughs> than a Tiger Burger from Heidi Ho. Truly, this is an amazing world that God has given us to live in. And we are its keeper. But there is also a world currently in our midst that if we're not careful, often goes unnoticed. Now, to find this world, we have only to begin looking at the news feeds that fill our screens. And for the first headline, you'll only need to travel 3,000 miles across the Atlantic to the war-torn Middle East. Some of you who serve in in our armed forces have seen these communities And there you'll meet former doctors and lawyers and nurses and school teachers and grocery clerks who now live as refugees along the Syrian border. Did you know that because of political conflict, some 68 and a half million families and children have been forcibly displaced from their homes around the world in places like Syria and Venezuela and Myanmar? Equally as heartbreaking, though, is the second headline a little less known, and that is the clean water crisis that is confronting our world. And young girls, largely young girls, who will forego an education and instead will walk six kilometers, that's nearly four miles, two times every day without fail, in search of dirty drinking water. Water that will take the life of some 14,000 children under the age of five every day. That's 5.2 million children each year, one child every seven seconds. And most of us are left wondering, how could these images be true of the same world that we call home, the same world that gives us a tiger burger from Heidi Ho? And I understand why most of us would find ourselves confused disoriented, maybe even in disbelief. And the reason is this, because that world is not ours. Children who will die from diarrhea or malaria are our children. A 12-year-old girl who will be sold into the practice of child marriage in India is not our daughter. A 10-year-old boy who right now is being recruited into a militia in the Congo is not our son. See, generally speaking, our kids have access to healthcare and education and an endless supply of clean drinking water from which to quench their thirst. 
Simply put, our stream has not yet been muddied by the accumulating debris far up in the hills. But the life of the village depends on the health of the stream. And the stream is our world, and you are its keeper. I am its keeper. So this morning, I wondered if we could wrestle together a little bit with what it looks like as a follower of Jesus to be a keeper of the stream. Like, what's required of me? What's required of you? See, this was a question that was echoing in the air, just hanging there the day that a young lawyer approached Jesus, trying to discern for himself what it was going to look like in his life to be a part of this new little community that was forming around Jesus. And this young lawyer is trying to find his place in it. And it just makes me think, aren't we all trying to discern that in one way or another? Like, Jesus, what does this look like, this following you thing? What does it look like for me right here, right now? Like, who must I be? What must I value? How must I respond in the coming and going of everyday life? And so in his discernment, this young lawyer has a question for Jesus. He says, Jesus, teacher, he says, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus replies, well, he knows that this young lawyer, he's a scholar, an expert in the Old Testament law. He's read it over and over again. So Jesus turns the question back. He says, well, how do you read it? You know the law of Moses. What do you think that it has to say? And uh, in other words, I think this young lawyer is coming to Jesus saying, like, what's going to be on the entrance exam for heaven? Like, what do I got to do to get a passing grade? And so then in answering his own question back to him that Jesus gave, he says this, pulling from all of his studies from the Old Testament law, he quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, a very famous passage of scripture in the Old Testament. It was called the Shema, something that every Jewish young boy would have memorized early in his life. And the Shema says this, you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul with all of your strength and with all of your mind. And then just for good measure, extra measure, this isn't in Deuteronomy chapter six, he skips over to Leviticus chapter 24 because he knows that Jesus sort of cares about this other people thing. And he says this, just for good measure, and, and you should love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus hears this message and he's impressed. He says, you got it, you got it. You do that and you will live. But it's not enough just to know the truth, is it? Like, don't we all want to, like, embody truth? Don't we want to live truth out? See, I don't think this man's question is simply about heaven alone. It's not just about what's the entrance exam going to look like for heaven. I think it might have a little something to do with how to bring heaven to earth. You remember Jesus prayed, my kingdom come, my will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. And so he asks Jesus one more question. He says, Jesus, then, then who, who is my neighbor? Like, how do I do this? How do I live this out? And that's when Jesus tells a story, a very famous story, about a Jewish man who was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho and was attacked by bandits, about a 17-mile journey. And those bandits stripped him of his clothes and beat him up and left him half dead on the side of the road. And as Jesus tells the story, you may remember, there's a priest that comes along, a Jewish man in distress, and a Jewish religious leader comes along down the road. And we would expect him to respond, but he doesn't. In Jesus' story, he drops his eyes and he passes by on the other side. But that's okay. That's all right, because there's another religious leader coming, a Levite, as Jesus describes it in his story, like a worship leader, a temple assistant. A Levite is coming, also a Jewish man who sees another Jewish man in distress on the side of the road. But he too, in Jesus' story, drops his eyes, looks away, and passes by on the other side. And then in Jesus' story, the most unlikely of heroes, Jesus says this, then a despised Samaritan. I mean, circle that word. If you have a Bible open, circle that word. Don't let it be lost on you what Jesus is doing here. A despised Samaritan, someone who culturally could have had nothing more out of common than what this man does with the Jewish man in distress. A despised Samaritan comes along, and yet when he saw him, he felt compassion for him. And he put the man on his own donkey, and he soothed him with 
olive oil and wine and he bandages him up and then he puts him on his own donkey and he takes him to the inn where he takes care of him. And he says to the innkeeper that day, listen, here's two silver coins. Take care of this man. And if the bill runs even higher than this, I'll pay you the next time that I'm here. And with this simple but very famous story, I think Jesus is beginning to illustrate what it's going to look like for you and me to be a keeper of the stream. And here's what I think it means. Simply put, I think it means that as followers of Jesus, we have to begin to cultivate a life that affirms dignity in every person. A despised Samaritan and a Jewish man culturally unlike each other in every way. And yet there is dignity present, affirming dignity present that then restores broken circumstances in our world. See, as a follower of Jesus, when we become a part of that community, this is who we are. This is what we do. A couple quick observations from this story. Something to know about the world that Jesus lived in. There were all sorts of racial and gender and socioeconomic discriminations that were alive and well. His world was a world that was not too unlike our own. Where children were devalued and sold into slavery. That happens in parts of our world still today. Where women had no rights and were seen as less than. Where ethnic divisions existed all over the place. Where economic inequalities exalted the rich and diminished the poor. Where political divisions caused people to demonize each other. And I am struck by the fact that it was into the midst of that culture that Jesus told this story. Jesus accentuating the fact that for all of the cultural differences that may divide us, amidst all of the arguments that may seem to justify the dropping of our heads and the looking away, we are, you and I, as the Samaritan did, are called to take the time to see each other, to truly see each other. I mean, put yourself in the story for a moment. Bend down as the Samaritan may have done and lock eyes with this Jewish man in distress. Raise your gaze as the victim may have done and feel your burden lift and hope descend. Can you feel the dignity that is present in this moment. See, there is a radical shift that is happening. In Jesus' story, poverty no longer is an impersonal statistic or a distant problem or a breaking headline. Suddenly, poverty has a face. It has an address. And it has a name. It is a man or a woman, a child of God, a family with hopes and dreams and gifts and abilities. Someone who is created in God's own image with dignity and value. The text says that when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And let me just tell you, whenever we have the courage to actually see someone for who they are as a treasured child of the most high God. Whenever we have the courage to see, we will find the will to respond. Second quick observation here is that when we finally respond, it is to be practical and deeply personal. I love it that that in Jesus' story, the man puts him on his own donkey walks beside him all the way to the inn, prepays his room, even says to the innkeeper, listen, if he breaks into that mini fridge that's in every hotel room and opens up that $12 bottle of water, I'll even cover that too. And then my favorite part of the story, he says, I'll be back. It is deeply relational. I'll be back. And we will get this figured out together. See, as followers of Jesus, not only do we affirm dignity, but we restore broken circumstances. And this has always been the heartbeat of Jesus' ministry. I mean, in Luke chapter 4, when Jesus preaches his very first sermon ever, when he goes into a small little synagogue in Nazareth and he climbs up into the pulpit, he could have chosen any scriptures to teach from, from the Old Testament that day. And yet, what was it that he chose? He reached behind him and he grabbed from behind him the Isaiah scroll and he unrolled the scroll and he simultaneously rolled up his sleeves with a vision 
of what life is to look like in the kingdom. When in Luke chapter four, he quoted these words from Isaiah 61, he said, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to who? To the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's grace. Gang, that's who Jesus is. That is what Jesus valued. That is part of what Jesus came to do. Good news for the poor, release for the prisoner, sight for the blind, freedom for the oppressed, dignity and a fresh start, a new beginning and hope for all. And that became the central value that was the bedrock of that first church in Acts chapter 2. In fact, in Acts chapter 2 and 3 and 4 and 5 and 6, the first church took so seriously the call to care for the poor that do you know over time there was a little phrase that began to develop to describe those very first followers of Jesus? Do you know what that phrase was? The North African theologian Tertullian captured it in his writings. When he said this of those first Jesus followers, he said, it is our care of the helpless, our practice of loving kindness that brands us in the eyes of many of our opponents. This is what they said of those first Jesus followers. This was it. They said, only look, only look, they say, at how they love one another. Suddenly the phrase that began to be shared throughout the community of people who were watching, who were looking in on these new Jesus followers was this. Those people love everybody. They love everybody. They choose everybody. You know, throughout the pandemic, uh, my son was doing school from home. He's 14 these days. So he was about, I think, seventh grade or so. And uh, he shared a little workspace with me down in my basement uh, all throughout that time. He, for months, he at his computer typing away, me across the room typing away at mine. And one day, Andrew sort of popped up and he said to me, Dad, I need to write a tribute paper for my English class. And I was wondering if I could write my tribute paper about you. And uh, naturally, I about fell out of my chair. But then he added this, or, or he said, should I write it about mom? (laughs) Now, I've been happily married for 18 years. I am smart enough not to touch that question. (laughs) Said, listen, buddy, you write that paper about whoever you want to write it about. Your mom, I, either of us would be honored if you would choose us. And so several weeks went by. And Andrew sort of popped back up from his desk and he came back over to me and he said, well, dad, today's the day, dad. Today's the day I have to present my tribute paper, dad. And I just wanted you to know I chose you. I chose you. And uh, those words melted me. They crushed his mom, of course. (laughs) But they melted me. And it made me think, don't we all want to be chosen? Don't we all want to be seen? Don't we all want to be affirmed? Don't we all want to be valued? I want to be chosen. You want to be chosen. There's a a little girl in Bartabla, Kenya. Her name is Michelle. She wanted to be chosen. See, in 2018, this is when our family started to take seriously this call to cultivate a life that affirms dignity in every person and spends our life redeeming and restoring broken circumstances. And that is when Michelle came jumping rope into our family. As I mentioned, she lives in Bartabo, Kenya. And in Bartabo, Kenya, until just recently, there was no source of clean drinking water. Michelle and other young girls just like her had to walk to a small pond twice a day to fill up a five-gallon jerry can with water. And this was the same small pond where Michelle's family would wash their clothes. It's where they bathed. It's where livestock would gather around the perimeter of that pond to drink and to relieve themselves. And you know that for years, that small pond was the leading cause of death in Michelle's village. And I got to tell you, when I first learned of the challenges that were facing Bartabwa, it wrecked me. But even more so was in knowing her. 14-year-old little girl with just as much inherent dignity as my daughter or my son. And so that's when our family decided to partner with Michelle and with her community in Bartabwa 
by becoming Michelle's sponsor. And it costs our family about $39 a month. And I'll just tell you, it's the best $39 that we spend all month long. And we pool it together with the $39 of lots of other families that are also sponsoring children just like Michelle in her community. And the impact is far greater and far more long-lasting than anything we could ever imagine. See, this is the result of that sponsorship. This is the clean water well that now sits at the center of Bartabwa. And these are the resilient mothers that are raising strong, beautiful, and capable young women and families. These are the grateful mothers whose courage and testimony is transforming far more than just their own families. I got to tell you, it's transforming ours. Because, of course, the life of the village depends on the health of the stream. And the stream is our world. And you are its keeper. I am its keeper. And so, church, the next few moments, Justin and I would like to invite you to find yourself in this story of Jesus, to do what his closing words were to that young lawyer, to go and do likewise. You see, because Justin and the team here has been sensing God calling you to make a difference in the lives of children in Tahipur, Bangladesh, a community that is very rural up in the northern region of Bangladesh there, a place where there are only 200 kilometers of paved roads, where everything else is dirt, where 25% of the children do not have access to clean sources of drinking water, where 50% of women are subject to violence and abuse in the fourth most difficult place in the world for women to live. But do you know that there is reason for hope in Tahipur? And that hope is you. It is, it's you because of your personal and deeply practical partnership with that community. So today, I'm going to invite you, and so is Justin, we're going to invite you together to say yes to empowering children living in poverty in Tahipur. And with $39 a month, to affirm their dignity and to restore their broken circumstances. Now, typically, over the last 70 years at World Vision, the way that I would invite you to do this is I would let you go into the lobby today where you would see dozens and dozens and dozens of pictures of kids on string lines. You might imagine seeing that there, right? Lots of pictures of kids that you could choose from. But a few years ago, we started praying big, bold prayers at World Vision. And we asked God to lead us to something that would allow us to further empower agency in the lives of children that we get to serve. And do you know that he honored our prayer by giving us an idea that has changed everything. See, he led us to ask the question, what would it look like if for the very first time, rather than us choosing kids, what if we could empower children to choose us? Watch this video. for the Church, there's a very special party that is going to be, cho- be thrown this Wednesday in Tahipur, Bangladesh. And do you know 
that the guests of honor at that party are going to be children who will have the joy and the dignity and the empowerment of choosing you. See, today we're going to do something that you've never done before, something super epic. Today we're going to invite you to take a photo of yourself. And then we're going to send that photo all the way to Bangladesh this weekend. And we're going to hang it in a room so that kids can walk in and they can see your photos hanging on a string line. And a child is going to have the joy of being able to choose to be in relationship with you. And then in turn, in that relationship, they're going to take a picture of them holding your photo and send it back to you for next weekend so that you get to meet the child that chose you. And they're going to send you a letter. And one of the first things you're going to read in that letter is, I chose you because. And you're going to be in relationship with a child that allows you to invest in their community and lift them out of extreme poverty. You know, this last week, we had the joy of meeting with the director of the program in Tahipur. Uh, His name is George. We were on a Zoom call together, Justin and the team here, and George and I, you can see Justin waving there. It's a good way, buddy. And we learned all about all of the challenges and the struggles that are happening in that community. And we learned about the ways that you as a church are going to resource that work and provide hope by sending your photos today. And I'm going to invite Justin to come and share a little bit about the vision that the Lord has placed on his heart for this initiative. But I want you to know that one of the very first photos that will get sent over is this one. It's Justin and Audrey and their girls because they too are saying yes to being chosen. So Justin, would you come and share more with us? So why am I excited of wanting to partner with World Vision? Uh, First of all, I think World Vision has such a legacy of uh, a trustworthy organization. You do have to be careful with what you partner with because you want to make sure that you are, you know, sewing into these things that the money actually gets to this place. And, And World Vision has a long history of helping the impoverished, and they lead, in fact, they lead the world in uh, in clean water and also food aid. But not only that, but when I was struck with this Tahipur, this area, this area that is, you know, about the size of Almogordo uh, as far as area-wise, but the population of our county, about 60,000 people. And in that 60,000 people, there are 233 mosques, 41 temples, and only one church. And I thought, what if the worship center really partners with this area and partners with this church and these and share the love of Jesus in such tangible ways? And this is a great thing. They have, World Vision has already established a great ministry in this area. In fact, they've uh, identified 4,600 kids that their families live under a dollar 90 a day. And of these 4,600 kids, 3,300 have already been sponsored. Isn't that awesome? 3,300 have already been sponsored. That means only 1,300 kids are left to be sponsored in this area that is roughly the same population as our county. And I think as a church... I want us to be able to put a dent in that 1,300 kids. And I want to set a goal. I want to set a goal of have 120 kids to be sponsored by our church. And I think that's a goal that we can do. I think it's a goal that we can establish and do. And it's going to take uh, your, uh, you know, kind of boldness to kind of step up and be a part of this. Now, I believe when you choose to be a part of this, to be chosen by a kid, I think... uh, it's going to be an amazing experience where you're going to be partnering with this child and helping with their education, uh, helping them get clean water. You're going to be helping establish uh, to help them and their families generate income so they can step out of. This is not a right. hand out. This is a hand up. And so this will help establish them to their family to be able to have the dignity to step out of extreme poverty. And I know that that's an amazing thing that's going to be happening, but I, I, I'm telling you, I think for some of us, this will be the first opportunity where you get to experience for yourself the joy of generosity. That when you correspond and you're on the front lines of being able to influence and and support this child, because for every child you support, there are four other children that are also elevated in that community. So it is a multiplier effect. I think you're going to discover the joy of generosity. In church, 
we have made a commitment to this county to be for Otero. Amen. I mean, we're for Otero. So don't, you know, you know, we're not for Donna Anna. God bless them. But we're for Otero. We made a commitment to be for Otero. But I just wonder, is there enough space? Is there enough room for us to also be for Tahipur? So I don't know about you, but I want to commit us to make a difference in a, in a village that is 13,000 miles away from here. And I think we can do that. Don't you believe? Amen? All right. Josh, come on up. Yeah, so I know you're probably wondering, okay, how, how do we do it, right? How do we, how do we make, make this step together? So here's what I want you to do. You all got a card when you walked in. It's on your, on your seat there. Go ahead and pull that card out. And then also pull out your cell phone, okay? Those two things together. Go ahead and pull your cell phone out. Here's how we're going to do this. You can say yes to being chosen in a very simple way. You're simply going to text a keyword to the cell phone, or on the cell phone that you have there. And if you're watching from home right now online, we invite you to do this from home as well. You're going to text this keyword, okay, TWC, super easy, TWC, to the number 56170. It's right there on your card. Go ahead and pull out your cell phone if you got it out. Open up your text messaging you know, app there and go ahead and text the keyword TWC to 56170. Zero. Now, if you're not exactly sure how to do this, take your cell phone, give it to a 13-year-old. They'll gladly text that keyword for you, okay? Here's what's going to happen. Once you text that keyword in, you're going to get a bounce back message. And that bounce back message is going to give you a link. You're going to click on that, and then you're going to be able to fill out a little bit of your information. One of the questions it's going to ask you is how many kids do you want to choose you? That could be one or two or three or more. And you just go ahead and fill that out and go ahead and hit submit. And then you're going to get a QR code. Now, if you're watching from home, it's going to invite you to click on a link to upload a selfie right from where you are at home. You can do that at home. But if you're here in this room, you're going to take that QR code out into the lobby today. And there's a team of volunteers out there who will help you take the most epic photo of your entire life. You're going to do that right here today before you even leave church. Because here's the deal. This is really, really important. We got to get this done before 7 p.m. tonight. It's why it's important to do it right here before you leave the church. It's why it's important to do it at home right now. Because tonight, right after 7 p.m., we're actually going to take those photos, upload them into a closed Facebook group for the worship center. So you can go online. You can see and celebrate each other who said yes to being chosen as well as you join that closed Facebook group. And then we're going to also send that photo all the way to Bangladesh tonight. And the team's going to start preparing that choosing party that's going to happen on Wednesday and reaching out and inviting families to come get to be a part of that party. And then on Wednesday, of course, those kids are going to have the joy of choosing you. But then you don't want to miss next weekend because as soon as they choose you and we take that photo and they write their letter, we're going to get them back here by next Sunday. There's going to be an envelope with your name on it and you're going to have the joy of meeting the child who chose you. So go ahead and pull out your cell phones, text the keyword TWC to 56170. Follow those prompts, take the most epic photo of your life here or at home, and then look forward to a really celebration Sunday next weekend, the reveal weekend. But would you pray for us? Yeah, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we just pause in the service Lord, we've been struck all week as we've been kind of preparing our hearts, doing the Matthew 25 challenge. And as we're identifying with those of the least of these that you talked about, Matthew 25, God, I just pray that you'll just put it on our heart. I pray, Lord, that whatever, when we have that, when they have that party Wednesday, Lord, that there are so many people that we'd be blessed. But ultimately, Lord, the blessing is really going to be for us to be able to experience what it's like to live a life of generosity. God, I pray for those people in Tahipur, but also pray for the hearts of everyone here in this moment making this decision. We love you, and we thank you for who you are in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. All right, you may be dismissed. We'll see you next week and get to celebrate the Reveal Weekend.